The traditional oyster season has arrived. That means oyster festivals are popping up all over the Delmarva Peninsula. First up is this Saturday, the 48th Annual Chincoteague Oyster Festival. Which is already sold out. But <laughs> whether you're going or not, you're gonna be interested to meet the Chincoteague man who reinvented the oyster business in the mid to late 1800s. His name is Thomas Downing. Now, we have a man here who can tell us all about Thomas Downing. His name is Jim Duffy. He's the author of Secrets of the Eastern Shore to tell us about Mr. Downing. Thanks for coming. Good afternoon. Always good to have you here. Always good to be here. I got to ask you about this. Right. Am I understanding this correctly? The man who revolutionized the oyster business was a black man who was living in slavery times. Yes. Thomas Downing's parents were enslaved uh, in Chincoteague. Um, their owner um, converted to Methodism, got religion, freed his slaves, so he became a free black man. He got the name Downing is associated if you're driving down Route 13 through Oak Hall and you pass Downing United Methodist Church. Yes. That's the family that is connected. That's oh, wow. the family okay. that is connected with him. So he, uh, Thomas Downing was in the late 1700s. He was growing up in the early 1800s. Uh, there not much is known about his childhood, but judging by what happened later, he did a lot of fishing and oystering while down in Chincoteague. Probably a lot of cooking with his mother and grandmother as well, um, because he really turned it into a pretty incredible story. But he didn't stay in Chincoteague. No, it's a little mysterious why he left. There's sort of uh, rumors that the Downings wanted to sort of recontrol the slaves that they had freed. It's not, it's not exactly clear. But anyway, he ran off, and he ran off to Philadelphia first, spent a number of years in Philadelphia, then found his way to New York. And then became a house painter and a house cleaner. There's ads in the newspaper that he took out. But he would also go oystering in the early morning and then have an oyster stand in front of his house, which was on Pell Street in New York City. So he had kind of just like a sidewalk oyster stand. So that was where he got started That's where he got in started. oysters. It took, yeah, and it, and it took 10 years uh, before he opened uh, an oyster place, and he did it with such a work ethic. It was incredible. He would go oystering at 2 o'clock in the morning, and then he would come back, and then he would unload his catch, and then he would take it to his restaurant, and then he would open his restaurant, oh and then goodness. he would cook the oysters, and then he would serve all the customers, wow. and then he would close, and then he would figure out all the books, and then he'd get up the next morning again at 2 o'clock in the morning and start it all over again. Okay, so he was still full of a lot of ideas, so yeah. tell us about this new approach. Okay, so I'm going to use a modern day example. You, you, you know what coffee shops used to be like back in the day, dark, yeah. dingy, right. full of kind of, you know, yeah. maybe a little yeah. shady yeah. character yeah. kind of thing. <laughs> That's what oyster joints were like in New York before Thomas Downing. Um, all they had was like raw oyster or, or fried oyster. That's all you could have. There were drunks. There was, you know, people smoking like crazy. There Ooh. was fights. Thomas Downing was the Starbucks of the oyster industry. <laughs> he went upscale. Do you remember when Starbucks came out and everybody's laughing? Who's going to pay $7 for a cup of coffee? That's exactly what he did. He put fancy chandeliers, fancy curtains, carpeting, expanded menu. He had one item, it was stuffed turkey with um, poached turkey with stuffed oysters, expanded this whole oyster thing. And all of a sudden, kind of rich white folks would feel comfortable bringing their dates or their mothers or their business partners out to the place where they wouldn't have gone before right. the oyster joint. And they flocked to his place. And all these rich white folks in the you know 1830s, 1840s, they all mentioned going to, to Downing's Oyster House in their journals. What's really interesting is how few of those journals, if any, if I recall, even mention the color of his skin. Is that right? He was such a big deal, the mayor of New York hired him for the event of the century when Charles Dickens, the writer, came to New York. And they had a huge reception with like 2,200, uh, 2,500 people. And that was Thomas Downing. So he was playing and, and, and hanging out in New York high society, but he Absolutely. never forgot where he came from, did he? No, he did not. He was, he was deeply involved in, in, in helping widows and orphans, African-American widows and orphans. At the time, there were some really evil people who were kidnapping free blacks and selling them down in slavery. He was involved with another group that tried to protect their legal rights uh, and their safety. He may have been involved, probably, maybe, was involved in the Underground Railroad. His son became a big activist in the Underground Railroad, but the, the 
one little anecdote that's really great is uh, uh, they had horse-drawn streetcars in New York that day, and there was a day when Thomas Downey, he was renowned for carrying himself with pride. He refused to give up his seat to a white man a century before Rosa Parks did the same thing. Really? Wow. Remember yeah. the name, Thomas Downing of that? Chincoteague, and this man here, wow. Jim Duffy of Cambridge, <laughs> Secrets Thank of the so Eastern much. Shore. Thank you for another fascinating story. Sure.